Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the seventh webinar in our Mark Salon program. I'm Rinalini Vasudevan, Senior Assistant Editor, Editor at Mark, joining you from Calcutta. And I'm here to introduce today's uh, session where we'll be looking at plant histories through the lens of art histories and vice versa. Uh, today's conversation is part of a new branch of the Mark Salon program, which we launched earlier this month, which is called Futures of Art Studies. Um, art Studies, of course, is an integral part of the revamped Mark magazine, which we'll be launching in a few weeks' time. Um, and under Art Studies, uh, we'll be looking at an unusual topic, which is art and science. Um, uh, it's a topic on which we've already had a very interesting Mark Salon session with astrophysicist Roger Molina and philosopher Sundar Sarukai. Uh, Roger and Sundar talked about uh, the kind of interesting interdisciplinary collaborations that have been happening over many years uh, internationally. And Marg is particularly interested in uh, documenting and encouraging more such work that's happening in India and South Asia. Uh, so it is with that interest in art and science that we have David and Eve uh, joining us today from Belgium. Um, David is an art historian uh, and uh, he studied uh, history, art history, as well as musicology at the University of Brussels in Ghent. Uh, he works with Amarant, uh, which organizes special courses and tours across um, art spaces in European cities, especially museums and opera houses. Uh, his prime areas of interest are uh, the art of modernism, as well as music history, um, in particular the music of the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, Eve is a plant biologist uh, who uh, has a PhD from the University of Leeds uh, as well as uh, Ghent and he is currently a professor at the VIBU Ghent uh, Plant Systems Biology. Uh, the VIB labs have been doing a lot of interesting work and uh, it's essentially uh, research emerging from life sciences which can then be applied to a variety of fields such as pharmacy, agriculture, industrial techniques. Uh, David and Eve have come together for a very interesting project started by VIB where they are using historical paintings to uh, trace plant uh, uh, evolution that's happened over centuries uh, and they're of course focusing on some very everyday plants and crops and vegetables and fruits um, which we don't really question very much but they've got interesting um, visual evidence and cultural explanations to tell us about how these have changed uh, and the idea is of course to look at it um, uh, within the larger space of interdisciplinary studies uh, and also to talk about the implications that this could have in a variety of fields really from botany to genetics to culinary arts and sciences and even the social sciences. Um, and uh, I think it would also go well with, a, with our larger interest in moving beyond just the human sciences to also look at the Anthropocene and our connections with nature. Uh, David and Eve uh, are going to be contributing to our December magazine. And uh, today they're going to be taking questions posed by uh, Rizio Yohannan, who's writer and publisher at our foundation. We'll have a 40 to 45 minute session with the three of them, after which we are going to be opening up uh, for questions from the audience. Um, I'll be taking questions that you post through the Q&A box um, and uh, preferably try and keep the questions as brief and direct as possible and also mention who they are addressed to. Um, and uh, at the end of this whole session, we'll also have two poll questions running. Uh, and we'd be grateful if you could share your honest feedback with us about those. Um, before we uh, move on to uh, Rizio and, you know, uh, we start the session, we would like to observe a two-minute silence for Kapila Vatsyayan, uh, a very well-known um, scholar of Indian cultural studies, as well as a fine arts administrator. Uh, and she was a long-term member of the Mark Board of Trustees. Unfortunately, she passed away today morning um, at her home in Delhi at the age of 92. Um, she was very well known for her contribution to dance studies. And, um, and she was also a Padma Vibhushan um, uh, uh, awardee in 2011. So here's remembering Kapilaji and we hope to keep alive her legacy at Mark.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrinalini, and uh, thank you, David and Eve, for joining us. And welcome, friends, and thank you very much for observing the two-minute silence with us for Kapilaji. This is uh, indeed a mm, kind of poignant moment for us. Uh, with the passing of Kapilaji, who was a true icon of cultural research for many generations of scholars, uh, we've come to a point of uh, shift in time. Uh, in addition to witnessing uh, the change all around us at this time, uh, as an organization, we directly encountered 2002 as a species of change this morning. Uh, when we were preparing for this webinar and suddenly we hear that uh, our trustee has passed on. So this was very, uh, you know, a kind of moment for us. But uh, so we, we the, the magazine which uh, Prinalni was talking about, we, we, we had actually sent it to press and we recalled the first pages of the magazine to include our dedication uh, to Kapilaji as a trustee. Uh, her support was really crucial in materializing this uh, idea of change that Marg is embracing at the moment. As we pay our homage to her, uh, may I also take this opportunity to announce the uh, launch of the new MARG. Uh, we have undergone those of uh, you who have been uh, with us, staying with us during this time, like last three, four months at least, know that we have really undergone uh, some radical trans transitions as an organization in the last one year. And the way the MARG team has held together to brave this very difficult and unforeseen time, I would say, and adopted and adapted to uh, an entirely new editorial path of, uh, say, uh, an interactive autonomy, I would say, uh, managing to bring out this issue that marks the beginning of our 75th year. The work of this team has been an inspiration for me uh, personally, and the remoteness of our locations uh, did not affect their sense of timeliness. It was very difficult to really change everything about this magazine and uh, not really able to see the groups uh, sitting together and discuss anything, manage things remotely. The lack of resources and uh, this kind of remoteness of location did not deter the team from initiating new things like all these webinars and everything. I, I say all these things now because uh, with uh, Kapilaji's passing today, it seems very, uh, it's a very um, <laughs> difficult moment for me also too, because she was also a personal friend um, uh, for a long time. Uh, she has been part of uh, many things which I had done even before joining Mark. So, uh, uh, and uh, I think this dedication that we do for her, the, for this magazine, um, is very important for me personally and for the Mark team. And uh, while we were doing this, everyone from the trustees and all those who came along, the consultants, all of these people in the last few months became a close friend of everyone at Mark. So we thought uh, it is best uh, to bring home this issue to all of you. Um, uh, by bringing all the people who have contributed to this magazine in, in various ways, not the, the writers but themselves, but uh, many people who have really helped us put this together during this difficult time. So I, uh, we are, uh, I'm just announcing the launch of this new Marg on October 7. I hope all of you will be there. Uh, we are having a, 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 a an event where we will actually tell the story of how this came together during this time. Please bring friends, uh, family, I know it's, a, it's an occasion to get together for us. As we mentioned in our last conversation, uh, and also as Mrinalini mentioned just now, the series of webinars, Futures of Art Studies, is uh, closely aligned to this new mark. Uh, that that we are uh, bringing to you this month and uh, extends uh, these set of conversations that we are doing here extends 
many of uh, the conversations that we have uh, within the magazine and take it to the larger uh, public domain. So on the cover of the September issue of our magazine, which uh, marks this new avatar, this is the cover, we, are, uh, we were already wondering if this year could be understood as a certain species of change. This might be a very different cover from what uh, people might be used to seeing on a mark cover, but we, we are really trying to see how this time can be reflected in a, and at the same time, uh, you know, reflected on with a certain kind of distance. So this is uh, the cover. And I would just like to also show you the contents page so that uh, you know how, the, how different it is. We have, uh, uh, as you can see, you have, we have three sec main segments. One is a, a core segment where artists of different, it's the, the core segment, this issue is called crisis and continuity, aptly because of the, of the difficulties that they're going through. And we have 11 artists uh, reimagining their practice, talking in their own voices about how they reimagine this time. We have uh, every issue, we will have an in focus. So this issue evoking the beginnings of Mark, we have architecture, we have some seminal essays, conversations, sketches of uh, architectural structures across the country by E.P. Unni. Um, and all that. And we also have art studies. That is where we, we are now talking about. We, we will have regular segments on art criticism, art education, art, art and science, art history. So it is in this segment that Eve and David will be contributing next in December. We also have a Mark Salon in, in the magazine. Uh, and uh, we, uh, most importantly, there is also another segment called archives. Uh, it is perspectives on the archives. So we are not just revisiting our archives, but we are requesting scholars to reflect on our archives and give contemporary perspectives. Thank you, Esther, for sharing. Just wanted to share this with all of you at this point, because uh, uh, on October 7th, I will, I will hope to see all of you. Uh, who are here at this moment to be part of this uh, this opening and uh, now uh, we, uh, we 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 don't i don't want to go too much into uh, uh, introducing what uh, what david and eva are going to going to do here and what kind of conversation we are going to have but uh, uh, they, they're, they're, they, this is a, a curious thing, you know, their friendship as well as their academic partnership have made some pioneering contributions to art genetics already. And uh, they will be telling us about this conversation. So it's a, it's a fascinating possibility of interdisciplinary scholarship that they are going to uh, open for us. They've already made some kind of movements and I'm sure their, uh, their intervention in art scholarship and in interdisciplinary scholarship, I would say, will be very, very seminal in the day, days to come and it will inspire many people, I'm sure. So without further ado, let me turn to them. Thank you, Eve and David, once again for joining us and sorry for taking this time because this is also a critical time for us. So we had to contextualize this for our audience also. Let's start with Eve. Eve, um, as academics, all of us know that interdisciplinarity is a, is a fashionable subject for conversation. You know? so people, people talk about it all the time in every conversation this term comes up. But uh, beyond individual projects driven by the passion of individual scholars, uh, we rarely see sustainable work happening at institutional level, uh, especially at the intersection of humanities and the sciences. Social sciences often find their organic ways of interaction. We find that uh, there, are, there is more interactive kind of work happening there. So perhaps it would be interesting to start this conversation with how a plant biologist and an art historian met and thought of working together professionally. We are curious to know how your interaction with David and his field uh, may have enriched your own field at large rather than uh, beyond your individual work. Of course, it has enriched your individual work, but how has it impacted your field at large? 
And do you also think this collaboration between the two of you will have some impact on the generally vertically specialized academic spaces? Eve, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have to start with uh, stating that we have been lifelong friends. I think we know each other for like 30 years now. <laughs> and uh, we, we were together at high school debating about history. And I was kind of trying to teach David a little bit of things about uh, biology and nature when he was coming to visit me at my parents' place in the middle of nowhere, uh, as he often referred to it. Uh, and and, and we, we kind of uh, went to university and we each went our, our own ways. So uh, I went into biology, kind of classical biology. I studied botany, systematics, morphology of plants. Uh, and that kind of always uh, attracted me. Uh, and in addition to that, I kind of followed up with, uh, with a PhD in, in molecular biology, plant, plant genetics. And, and David went his way into history, art history, musicology. Uh, but, but we always remained friends. And uh, now and then we travel together. So we go and visit uh, places. We go to uh, interesting cities. We go to interesting regions uh, that are culturally historically interesting but also have some sort of biological interest uh, occasionally i still remember introducing the puffins to david at some point during one of these trips and and during one of these um yeah kind of visits to saint petersburg uh we were standing in front uh, of a painting and and i think that that kind of uh, moment sparked uh is kind of the 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 starting point for the project that that we developed uh, because we were debating if the fruits and vegetables that were depicted on that painting were really kind of accurately depicted uh, i was kind of questioning that okay what you see here this is an, a weird looking watermelon uh, which which was kind of cut in half and which was kind of looking a little bit unusually pale uh, not this kind of typical dark red that you would imagine with a with a watermelon and and, and my argument was okay maybe this is just a bad painter. Uh, maybe this guy was not able to, in a kind of realistic way, depict this uh, particular piece of fruit. And, and uh, David kind of replied to that, that this was one of the best painters that was around in that time. Uh, so Franz Schneider. So if he depicts it like that, it must have looked like that. And then we started looking into, into okay, can we find an explanation for why it looked different? Uh, are there more examples? of uh, strangely depicted watermelons and we started to to expand this to to other fruits and vegetables uh, we kind of quickly realized that, that uh, carrots were another nice example where you see that there is an enormous diversity of carrots that are being depicted on uh, some of these paintings colors that we now uh, since a couple of years uh, in europe start to see reappearing in our supermarkets where we have instead of the kind of typical uh, orange carrot we also get now these purple red yellow and, and, and so on and so forth uh, and, and we started to look into that uh, is this common uh, can we find a time point when these uh, varieties appeared or when they were replaced by by another color uh, when the kind of orange ca carrot emerged and can we also find molecular explanations for that and i think that's one of the one of the key things is that we are not just observing what we see on these paintings we're not kind of just cataloging this uh, painted diversity uh, we're also trying to link that with our enormous uh, genetic knowledge that we have uh, at the moment and i think that's that's one of the uh, important strengths of this project because you really have to to bring uh, two disciplines uh, that are really kind of far apart uh, together uh, you also start to see now that uh, in, for example, archaeobotany, um, people start to embrace genetic information to determine what is being buried in, in cesspits or what kind of archaeological evidence people are uh, unearthing. Uh, and I think that that's kind of uh, important now to kind of use this new technology to, to start and find explanations for how certain things uh, look like. And we are, I think we have reached the stage where our knowledge on molecular biology, on physiological processes, on developmental processes is uh, growing and is kind of, uh, we, we have good ideas uh, how something should look like based on its 
genetic evidence how something should taste like uh, what kind of color it should have and so on. so we can now really find explanations for for all of that um, and bringing this together uh, really allowed us to um, build stories to kind of really say this is how uh, strawberries uh, were domesticated and how we kind of got to our modern cultivated strawberry uh, trying to then also find the underlying uh, molecular complexities uh, and we can go into into details maybe a bit a little bit later um, and I think it's 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 a way to uh, to enrich uh, both our sciences I, I teach David about molecular biology about uh, physiology about genetic components what particular proteins are doing, uh, how they are steering uh, particular biochemical uh, processes, enzymatic reactions that will yield particular colors. How do you get the color red? How do you get the color orange uh, and purple and so forth and, and, and so on. Uh, and and uh, from his side, he's kind of teaching me about history, about art history, about uh, painters and how reliable they are and how they are able to depict things in, in a nearly yeah, kind of photographic way um, so that that's kind of really uh, allowing us to 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 merge these two things um, and, and i think uh, by doing this now we, we we were also i think we we're also able to to apply this to to a general public uh, on the one hand we can use it to teach people about art and then kind of the things are highlighted kind of appreciate them to look at paintings in a very careful uh, careful way uh, and on the other hand, we can we can also use this as as an easily uh, accessible system uh, project uh, to teach people about molecular biology, about genetics, about how diversity comes about, and that it's not just all um, man-made, lab-made, GMO-related stuff. I mean, that there's really this kind of enormous genetic diversity that uh, that drives uh, differences in. Uh, appearances in the kind of uh, phenotypes and how things look and, and taste like. So, so it, it, it has been uh, enormously enriching for, for both, of us, uh, both of us, also kind of getting the feedback from, from the community and from the general public and, and, and how they kind of uh, appreciate what we, what we are doing. Mm. Uh, thank you, Eve. Uh, David, um, Eve just talked about how looking at uh, art can help put a biological species on a, on a time map and track down its evolution. And also uh, the other benefits of it, like in terms of making molecular biology accessible to the common public and all that. Uh, museum goers and uh, art aficionados so may be able to spot depictions useful for plant science, you know, the way Eve just described. But how do you see this approach as, a, as an art historian? The quality and style of the artist may deliberately distort the form because of, 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 of certain kind of aesthetic that the, the artist follows. Are there some art historical tools uh, to assess the reliability of these sources as a scientific uh, tool? Um, I mean, uh, to study this scientifically and if so, what are these filters? And most importantly, how does this approach enrich art and art history as a discipline? Over to you. Well, that's a, an excellent question and one of the main problems at the start of our investigation. Um, Eve was talking about our trip to St. Petersburg and how we enrich each other in terms of uh, biological knowledge and historical or art historical knowledge. And then um, what we are trying to do now is to kind of cross fertilize our two disciplines um, in the same way that we do as friends. So we um, are trying to bring two equal partners to the table, uh, which is art history on one side, on the other side, uh, modern genetics. And the um, episode that Eve described, standing in front of a picture in uh, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, uh, really conjured up the main problem because uh, I asked him, now this is a weird looking watermelon, uh, might this be the way in which, uh, or which, uh, uh, might this be the way that uh, watermelons used to look back in the 17th century? And he said, well, I don't know, it could have been a bad painter. So this kind of uh, conversation where, um, that we were having, it was 
the very first conversation that we were having on this project, we didn't even know it was a project then, uh, really uh, went to the heart of the matter. Because I think, or I sincerely believe, that um, many um, not so culturally inclined biologists, uh, which Eve is, is not is very culturally interested, but that other biologists um, kind of discard the idea of using art as a means to uh, um, know something about the genetic history of our foods. Now, I think that the main argument there is that scientists distrust the evidence. They do not know whether or not to trust a painter and his picture. Uh, after all, we are dealing with art, and art has this idea of being a bit, uh, you know, fanciful. Uh, there is a lot of fantasy or personal invention, very individual artistic expression. And you don't really know if um, an artist is depicting something true to life or not. In other words, it is not a picture, it is a painting. So um, that's where art history comes in. And that is my job as an art historian, is to work out how can we trust the evidence. The evidence is there. Um, the only thing you need to do is to find a filter, uh, to really filter out the things that you can use, why, when, how, and the things that you cannot trust or should not trust. For example, if you have a, a painting by a still life by, by Brock or by Picasso, and you're trying to work out how Napoli looked at the beginning of the 20th century, it, it might look kind of squarely looking. So that's unusable. That, that's evidence that we, that we really cannot use. However, there are other ways in which we can trust the evidence. And um, that is to cross-reference the things that are on pictures with things that are still there. In other words, um, one of the main problems is that uh, we are studying perishables. So uh, there are today no apples from the 18th century. They're all gone. Um, they perished. And uh, the things that these uh, artists paint, they are not only perishables. They paint people who have a certain way of dressing. They paint architecture. This architecture might still be there. If you look at a market scene where there's a lot of fruits and vegetables on the, on the table and there is architecture in the back and it says this displays this market uh, on, on uh, this, particular, uh, this particular city, you go to that exact spot and you can still recognize very easily uh, this architecture, then you can really cross-reference how, how very true to nature this picture really is. If there are musical instruments, for example, depicted on the picture that are still in museums today, then you know, right, we can trust the evidence or we cannot trust the evidence. So there is a kind of um, mixture or um, like a whole cascade of um, uh, uh, methods that you can use in order to figure out how trustworthy your source material is. Um, Maybe we can illustrate this by way of, uh, I think it is uh, the Jeroen Bos picture, which was my picture number four. I know we can get it on the screen somewhere. Um, yes, it is the number, uh, no, this is uh, Brugel. It is the one by Bos. Uh, might be a bit more down, I guess. Um, in any case, um, Jeroen Bos was a, um, painter from uh, the Netherlands, um, painted in the 16th century. Yes, this is uh, Bruegel. I'm looking for the, the other one. Um, I know I labeled it my number five, but these I are think I, David, I think I think your number, no, your images are not in the final cut. Oh, oh, okay, no problem. Well, um, um, okay, let, let's uh, talk about this one by um, Peter Artsen. Um, the main thing is that, um, if you look at a picture like this, it is very unlikely that all the fruits and vegetables you can see on this painting um, would be uh, on sale at the, exactly the same time. I mean, uh, painters at that time did not really, um, they did not really heed to the seasons. So this might be a problem in interpreting uh, this kind of picture, but what they do um, depict accurately is the shape and colors of these fruits and vegetables. So um, the Jeroen Bos painting that I was talking about has this gigantic but this really huge um, strawberry. Uh, the strawberry. I, I will 
sorry, sorry to interfere. I will add the, the Bosch one to the chat so people oh. can then click click on the link and then they have the visuals that you're that you're referring to. That's perfect. Oh. So um, then um, people will be able to notice that uh, there are uh, strawberries on that picture that are larger than life, that are larger than the, the people standing next to it. And um, if you're trying to look out how big was a strawberry back in uh, the day of your boss, back in the 16th century, then you will be kind of misled by this painter. However, that does not mean that the strawberry picture that he uh, he's making is not morphologically correct. Um, so you can use a picture for certain information. Uh, you cannot use it for other information. And this is the kind of lens I was talking about that we need to put on our research uh, in order to filter through the images that are relevant to our investigation. Yeah, th thank you, David. That was very insightful because this will be a, a kind of doubt in the minds of many people, like uh, in terms of like you know what are the filters that you use, etc. Uh, but uh, I, I, let me come to Eve with this question. It is on the one hand, it is very very exciting to explore the, the scientific potential of art. Um, across the globe, because uh, these uh, these paintings would be made by different people across time and space, so it's a very interesting proposal, and it could open uh, uh, open doors to various uh, facets of knowledge. But uh, when we try to, my specific question to you is: when we try to understand or re-understand an aesthetic object. Uh, like a, a painting, which was perhaps inspired or necessitated by a political or social factors other than purely aesthetic considerations, of course. But if you're using that as a piece of uh, data for another discipline, uh, say plant science, what are the methodological challenges involved there? Uh, also collections. Uh, collections themselves may be prompted by factors other than aesthetic, you know, not just making of the painting, but also collections. So could you also talk about uh, these challenges with respect to collections from various spaces, say European collections like that of the Louvre, uh, as different from museums in Asia or uh, Central and South America? Uh, how do you look at this? Uh, if, yeah. So, so I mean, to, to answer the first part of your of your question, I think uh, if you see something depicted like only once, as as a biologist, um, as as a life scientist, you will you will question and doubt that. No, you will you you really want to see higher numbers. So it it is a matter of frequency. So how often do uh, painters depict the same weird thing? Weird thing, um, and and do they do this from one particular location or do they do this from different locations so it's kind of it's it's uh, it's not only a matter of can we trust the painter um, but is this also something that is rather common at the time in that in that region and is it common in in multiple regions so for example if you have uh, if you have a watermelon that that looks a little bit uh, pale um, that has these kind of strange swirls on uh, on the inside you could also argue um, that okay this is maybe uh, a watermelon that was not fully matured that was stressed during its uh, development and by accident this uh, painter took that wa watermelon as a representative example when he was uh, making that particular uh, painting um, and i think there we have we have the example of of stanchi um, where um, the painter really depicts something that looks a little bit uh, unusual and then the, the whole discussion a couple of years ago was um, is this now a true looking watermelon and then you can bring in a number of uh, botanical concepts so for example if you take uh, the maturation of a watermelon it starts off as indeed being pale uh, whitish uh, and then it kind of goes through a pinkish phase uh, and eventually it ends up as being something that is dark red on the inside now the dark red stage is accompanied by the typical black seeds that we all know from from a watermelon um, so if you have a pale looking watermelon at that stage the seeds have not matured yet so they're not black so that means if uh, stanchi or one of these other painters 
would have depicted an immature watermelon, he should have depicted it with pale seeds. But that's not the case. He depicts it with dark seeds, which indicates that this was a watermelon that has matured and that probably has not been stressed during its development, which uh, implies that, okay, at some point, that kind of watermelon must have been uh, common. Also because other painters like, like Echoed uh, also depict something, something similar. So that means that if you have people, uh, artists depicting these things from different regions, in different eras, it must be something that that uh, that was rather common at that time. And you see the same thing happening with uh, with the carrot. So, for example, the carrot that was typically depicted uh, early on, kind of speaking, what is it, 15th, 16th, uh, early 16th century, uh, had like a variety of colors. Um, and then you gradually see that the orange carrot became becomes more common. Uh, and you see that it kind of pops up on these uh, market scenes. Um, and like you said, this could, could be associated with, um, with political events. I mean, there's, there there's, has always been this, this story that the appearance of uh, the orange carrot is associated with uh, the Dutch uh, royal house. Uh, this is probably not true. I think they, they might have exploited this accidentally. Uh, when it was there, but I think this was not really uh, ordered uh, or requested by them uh, towards breeders make us an orange carrot. Uh, so there, there's also a number of uh, historical aspects that we can there take, take into account. So you have things that are being depicted uh, in a certain way. Um, another example is the strawberry. So if you look at uh, a strawberry in the 15th, 16th century, you often see the wild strawberry being depicted. It often appears uh, at the feet of the Virgin Mary uh, because it also has this kind of religious connotation. It has this kind of holy trinity because of the trifoliate leaf. Uh, the, the drooping head, uh, flower head and, and, and uh, fruits kind of refers to the humbleness, the earthliness of, of the Virgin Mary. Uh, and uh, you see that this is, this is there being depicted. Later on, you also see these kind of uh, little fruit bowls that are uh, filled with these kind of wild strawberries that are presented as some sort of snack that are being depicted. But at a certain stage, what uh, mid, mid 18th century, we start the modern cultivated strawberry appearing on these paintings. And the reason behind that is that only at that time, we see that we have the two necessary ingredients to come to this, uh, to this kind of modern cultivated variety brought together in France, where breeders were growing two strawberry varieties next to each other. They kind of cross fertilized and they gave rise to this rather big looking uh, modern strawberry, which was very tasty, uh, which was kind of uh, very flavorful. And these two varieties are a variety coming on the one hand from uh, North America, uh, Fragaria virginiana, and on the other hand from uh, South America, Fragaria chiloensis. So these two varieties from those regions need to be brought to Europe at, at, at a certain stage. And uh, that kind of also goes together with these uh, political interventions, um, spying, uh, trading routes that, that, that are happening, and, and maybe David can, can elaborate a little bit on how the strawberry reached our, our modern shores. Um, so that also becomes important. So where can you, uh, where do these things come from? And do we then see in those regions things uh, being depicted uh, like that? Uh, kind of going back to uh, the collections that we are using for this, I think at the moment we have, we have been using mainly um, European-centered collections. Uh, big museum which we can easily access, uh, Louvre, uh, Hermitage, St. Petersburg, uh, British Museum, places like that where we can, we, we, we can kind of uh, routinely visit those places. Uh, but of course we also want to gain access to uh, smaller collections, uh, paintings that are in local mansions, in castles somewhere where people go on holiday and uh, where they travel and they observe a certain thing. Uh, that, that could be valuable for, for our work, which would otherwise, uh, otherwise be hidden. And beyond that, of course, we want to really tap into these um, historical art historical collections from other continents, 
uh, especially since uh, a lot of our fruits and vegetables are coming from uh, these, these other continents. Um, and that kind of, again, uh, goes with uh, the discovery of these continents, uh, with the trade routes that, uh, that were uh, established. And uh, it is kind of important to see how these things were depicted and uh, how they kind of were part of the local life uh, in, for example, South America, where we all know that, that we have tomato, potato, uh, corn uh, coming from. Um, on the other hand, you have, uh, you have Asia. Uh, and, and if you go back to, uh, to our story of the carrot, the, the domestication of the wild carrot uh, was likely uh, somewhere in northern India, Afghanistan, kind of Afghanistan are kind of the feet of the Himalaya. Uh, and then it kind of reached, uh, reached uh, Europe and was, was further uh, domesticated and kind of uh, developed different colors. And probably the original one was rather purple red in color color and then then we see that uh, in europe uh, the the orange one suddenly becomes uh, more popular and this probably had some kind of uh, culinary culinary reason uh, so we were all cooking these uh, these particular stews and if you make a stew with with uh, with the purple reddish carrot it will lose its color so the, the anthocyanin uh, that, that is in this purple carrot will kind of leak out uh, of its uh, storage vacuoles and your, your stew will start to look a little bit brownish and not, not very appetizing. Uh, on the other hand, if you do that with, uh, with an orange carrot, it will, it will kind of retain its color uh, because the, the orange color, color, the carotenoids, are stored in a different kind of organelle that uh, is not leaking out the, the color. So that kind of also brings this kind of uh, physiological cellular explanation to why people suddenly changed from, from a purple to, uh, to an orange carrot. And on the other hand, we see that probably towards, towards China, that the red carrot is uh, likely more popular. But we, do, we lack at the moment the, the depictions uh, that kind of prove the fact that in the, in the kind of 15th, 16th, 17th century, uh, we have these uh, red carrots being predominantly popular in, in, these, uh, in these regions. So I think that's why it's, it's really, really essential that we also bring these areas uh, on board in, in our research to kind of really extend our uh, collection and our database, um, and which kind of really makes us call upon the audience to, uh, to help us with this, because I think it's important that uh, we can't go to all these places. I think, uh, I think our wives already allow us to travel enough together. Um, so so we, we kind of go to, to, uh, to a lot of places, but of course we can't visit uh, everything. Uh, so if we have a bigger database and we have more people contributing to that database, also from regions where we're not really familiar with, uh, that would kind of really enrich our database and would really help us to establish and refine our timelines on when, when something was domesticated. And I think in addition to that, it's, it's, again, it's important to also tap into this local knowledge uh, because there are certain fruits and, fruits and vegetables that we are not really familiar with. Uh, so there is this uh, painting from Eckhout, it also depicts this, this watermelon, but there is also something that really uh, at first glance very much uh, resembles uh, a paprika. Uh, but if you then have this kind of local input, uh, if somebody from South America, where, where Eckhout was painting uh, at the time uh, in Brazil, if, if you have somebody giving their view on that painting, they immediately recognize that object as uh, a cashew nut. And this kind of uh, paprika liking, look like uh, outgrowth that, that is associated with, uh, with the nutty bit. Uh, so it's really also important to, to bring in um, this kind of local knowledge, the kind of knowledge from breeders uh, in, 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 these, in these other countries. And I think this, this will really allow us uh, to kind of build a, a community of uh, people who are interested in art and, and, and kind of send us paintings and things like that, but also people who are interested in um, growing things and gardening in, in, uh, in biology and morphology and, and these, kind of, uh, these kind of things. Um, and another nice example here uh, is, is uh, the potato. Which, which kind of also comes from, from uh, Central South America. And uh, there we have uh, the moche who kind of make these, uh, this kind of pottery that really looks like, 
like a potato. So you really recognize this is this kind of irregularly lobed uh, potato. It really has this kind of uh, typical char characteristics uh, of a potato that kind of as, as, as a botanist, as a biologist, kind of allows you to say this, this is now a, a potato. So it kind of also goes beyond uh, just paintings. I think we can also refer to, uh, to pottery uh, to, to, and to other uh, elements that, that could be useful. And I think it, it, it's also really important in order to be able to draw a conclusion towards a certain object that, that we have enough information. Uh, so we, we need information on, uh, on the period, on the painter, on the location, um, and then details of what, what is being depicted. Because uh, very often it is botanically rather difficult to say, is this now uh, a carrot, a white or a kind of yellow, uh, pale looking carrot, or is this a parsnip? So if you don't have the leaves being depicted together with the kind of root uh, vegetable, it becomes very difficult. So, so we also need, or we also kind of hope that painters sometimes add this kind of additional information, which then helps us to uh, identify the species that is actually being, uh, being depicted. And therefore we also then uh, request from the public to send us as many details as possible from that painting that they observed uh, in, in order to allow us to make those, uh, those conclusions. Uh, thank you if this is wonderful and also a call to action. I'm sure many people um, uh, they, who are collectors among the audience, uh, they would all, uh, already be thinking, okay, let's go back and look at the, some of the paintings that we have and uh, see if, uh, if this is, uh, you know, something like this can be identified. And I also think this is very important because it makes it a kind of public intellectual project um, involving uh, the larger public uh, across uh, across the world uh, in a project like this, so uh, it's it's it, I'm very happy that you know we are doing this conversation here, and if some of the some among the audience can really help in this project, that will be great. Also, um, yeah, coming back to all uh, this 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 conversation that uh, we are having uh, about uh, the political factors and international relations that may have contributed to the arrival or disappearance of a particular crop in the market at a particular time. David, uh, such factors could also have uh, forced some uh, scientific research or uh, experiment at a given time. But as a historian, do you think uh, your work with Eve might lead to other interdisciplinary trajectories, say in convergence with social sciences or economics, sociology, international relations, for instance, uh, how do you envisage the futures of interdisciplinarity in this in this regard? How do you see this? Well, I think that um, interdisciplinary research used to mean uh, I'm a historian, someone else is an art historian, let's work together. Or uh, I'm an archaeobotanist, I'm a molecular biologist, let's work together. So these kind of disciplines were very close together and it's the obvious way to make a connection uh, if you're studying a particular uh, object. Now for disciplines who are that far apart as molecular biology, genetics on one side and history, art history on the other, uh, it is um, only possible through what I believe is um, a collection of uh, big data. So one of the key elements here is um, the collection of our data that should pass through the filter that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so usable information. And this database should, um, uh, on the one side, be big, it should be large, it should cover a lot of ground, a lot of material, but it should also have or include the best sort of material that we can sift through. Uh, for example, there is this um, difference between the quality and the quantity of your database. And um, we do have a lot of these pictures depicting strawberries that are really tiny, uh, which are collected into a bowl, uh, Eve was explaining. And I tried to uh, post the pictures um, in the commentary section, uh, but I 
was a bit confused and I thought all panelists meant everybody, but it's all panelists and attendees now. So uh, it's the material is over there. But um, the uh, painting by Adrian Korte, which I also posted, shows exactly this. It shows a small bowl with these small strawberries uh, inside. Now, uh, we literally have dozens of these kind of depictions, um, all being painted in uh, the low countries in France. Um, it should be nice to find the very earliest depiction of a rather large strawberry. So this um, um, uh, Fragaria ananasa that uh, Eve was talking about, which was this uh, kind of uh, hybrid between uh, the two uh, American um, strawberries. Well, uh, we have those, but only at the end of the 18th century, while this um, uh, this particular strawberry was already present in France in the first half of the 18th century. So it should be really neat to find this large uh, strawberry. So this is kind of the qualitative um, aspect of your database. So for example, if, uh, well, I know there's an uh, Indian audience listening, if we have in Indian art, uh, I don't know, a 2000 year old banana that is somewhere depicted, well, that would be interesting for us because we, we lack this kind of information. Um, we uh, are looking for example of the first depiction of a potato in 16th century Spain. Uh, we, we have no depictions of uh, Spanish still lifes or whatnot uh, in the 16th century with potatoes on them. We know uh, Spanish people were eating them but we have no depictions. So these kind of black holes in our database are very hard to fill. And this is kind of the um, overall sweep that you need to do. So this is only possible uh, with new technology. Um, for example, we are trying to find the funding to develop an app so that people can very easily um, send us the relevant information, uh, which is for them very convenient. It only takes uh, literally a few seconds. Um, whereas now we are asking them to take three separate pictures, send them to us, which is kind of a, um, a time lag between they seeing the painting and they sending us the information. And some people get discouraged in between and forget about letting us know this interesting bit that they saw. So if we are trying to speed up this process, we uh, are building big databases with big um, uh, with a lot of qualitative and quantitative information there. Uh, we need to make it very handy if we want to work with a larger audience. And we ask this participation of people who are art aficionados and then go to museums and uh, like to collect uh, images. So we are asking their help and their participation, uh, which is in turn only possible with the technology that must be developed uh, for this end. And uh, only then, uh, in the end, do you have the source material to seriously consider uh, publishing some kind of definitive version of what, when, where, how did uh, some crops develop and so on. So I think uh, we're looking very optimistic uh, to the future uh, because we do believe that technology will um, serve us in that regard and uh, that uh, our research will be greatly stimulated by an even greater impetus of, uh, of this kind of data. So um, I do think that the reason why it has not been done 50 years ago uh, is because it was too difficult to do so. Mm -hmm. yeah. David, sure, David tell, sorry, sorry, tell us more about the political connections between the strawberry and, and how this kind of reached our shores. No, I mean, this is, this must excite people because it's all, it's also a very, very funny, funny story. Uh, uh, it, it's true. And I, I love telling it uh, because um, it, it is very an endearing story. It starts out with um, the King of France, Louis XV, losing his favorite mistress, who was Madame de Pompadour, who was kind of a cultural image at the time. So uh, the king was extremely sad, starts out as a romantic fairy tale, and uh, he was very interested in botany and science, and there was this very young uh, gardener in the uh, gardens of Versailles who um, tried to cheer up the king by presenting him a plant with a very peculiar um, strawberry, because the strawberries were immense, they were huge. And so the king asked this very young man, he was uh, 17 years old at the time, I guess, um, so where did you get those strawberries? Where do they come from? 
And this uh, person called Duchesne was the name of the gardener. He said, I, I don't really know. So, okay, how do you grow them? Well, I don't know. Where do they come from? Are they indigenous? Because we only know these very small strawberries and he didn't know. So um, the king looked at this teenage face and said, well, that's something for you to find out. And, and he did. So um, he started to think and to ask people. And that set him on a um, course to a conversation with a, a guy named Frézier, which is very funny because Fraise in uh, French means strawberry. So this guy is Mr. Strawberry. So he uh, asked him, uh, this Frézier, do you know anything about the strawberry? And um, this Frézier said, yes, I, I do know a great lot about it because I was the one who brought the South American uh, species to, uh, to France. Oh, really? So then there's a, an exchange of letters in which um, Frisier tells the tale. He says, the reason why nobody knows about it is because, one, it is a commercial trade secret, and two, uh, I used to be a spy. So in, in kind of James Bond style, he was sent by the King of France, which was at the time Louis XIV, the, the Sun King. He was sent to uh, the Americas to spy on the Spanish. So he was mapping out Spanish fortifications and trade routes and whatnot when he suddenly at the uh, market of Concepcion noticed very large strawberries. And he knew that the king happened to like strawberries, he was very interested in botany, and so he decided to take uh, with him back to France in, in a fifth month voyage back to France, um, these uh, eight strawberry plants, of which I believe uh, only half of them survived. And uh, he gave one to the king and he gave one to the garden of Versailles. But uh, he kept one for himself and um, started um, with some associate, uh, associates to try and breed these large strawberries, which he did in the north of France because he knew he'd had a market in London in the north and a market in Paris in the south. So um, at first it didn't work out because what he didn't get was that um, the large strawberries that he uh, took with him uh, were only uh, the female uh, species, the, the, the female plants. And he didn't work out the fact that they had to, um, had, that there had to be pollinated in some way. So uh, putting these strawberries in roles with another um, exceptionally exotic uh, strawberry was um, uh, the strawberry coming from North America, what uh, Eve called the Fragaria virginiana. And, um, then they started to pollinate and then you have these big strawberries which is if you think about it kind of the result of um, uh, espionage and uh, france and spain trying to fight for supremacies over the seas and we wouldn't even know about it <laughs> was it not for uh, the king who asked this young man can you find out where these big strawberries came from because it was such a top secret project that uh, if Duchenne hadn't started writing with uh, Frézier, we would never even know about how this uh, strawberry ever came to be. So that is, in fact, a very fascinating and, and really thrilling story. How it never was turned into a movie as a mystery to me uh, is something that we should really consider. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful story. And uh, so your, uh, uh, you know, the focus on archives and all these kind of, these are also stories which must go into the archives, I think. <laughs> you know, not just uh, the way, we, maybe it's a way to actually re-understand databases and archives. So they, uh, before we open this to the uh, audience, I would like uh, one, uh, to ask one question uh, with two parts to each of you. Uh, it's about the archives, actually, because you are talking about the importance of big data and uh, the importance of uh, this database. And also now with the story, uh, David is kind of indicating that the databases should not be dry, that kind of uh, spaces, but it should, it can be um, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, very interesting, it can be made interesting, accessible to people. Um, if uh, from there, let's look at uh, our art uh, uh, archives as a, a space. If you are uh, looking for a certain ancestor of a crop, for instance, it might be present in a painting, but uh, its name may not be mentioned, or it might be just one of the elements in that painting. 
no? And private collections may not even follow any standard documentation method. So this might uh, mislead researchers in terms of timelines or uh, ge geographical origins or even species recognition. So uh, when, especially when you are asking people to contribute, you know, uh, looking at this public project, uh, how do you tackle these archive and documentation related issues? That is the part for you and David. Do you think the accessibility of art itself is a problem? This is a concern that Marg is currently raising with agencies like the UNESCO. Sometimes national boundaries become uh, impenetrable, especially in conflict zones. In such cases, can the requirements of scientific and academic research become a, a kind of compelling force to position art as a greater common inheritance uh, transcending borders. So these two things. E with E. Uh, shall we start? Yeah. yeah, that's 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 really that's a, that's a beautiful point you you raised there. No, because um, that that's kind of that really is at the heart of what we're trying to do. Is that it's very difficult to rely on the databases as they are now. Uh, even and and you were referring to to smaller collections, but even for bigger collections, no, there, there there are numerous still lives which which are kind of full of very interesting fruits and vegetables and if you can if you then go to the title or the catalog uh, because there is a little monkey somewhere in a corner it's referred to as still life with monkey so there is this kind of dominant interest in naming the animal that is on the painting and forgetting about all the very very exciting and cool botanical stuff that is on there so so therefore it it, it and it, like I said, this is not only the case for the smaller collections, but also for true for, for a lot of bigger ones. Um, although this is this is now now improving, uh, and it has been really helpful for us to to advertise this kind of concept because we're now getting all sorts of information from from individuals, but also from museum that that really send us uh, detailed information on their on their collections. Uh, so that that kind of really helps. But it remains very important to really eyeball the painting you have to you have to look at it and you have to look at it closely because like the strawberry at the feet of the virgin mary that i was referring to earlier that's that's like a tiny little plant that is somewhere in the corner so so people really need to carefully look at at these works and then say okay there is something there i think it is this i recognize it uh, and and it, this can be can be useful for us um, and i think in addition to that we really need to to elevate uh, the kind of citizen science that we aim to do with this project to another level. So not only uh, having the people sending us stuff, but really kind of asking their participation in naming these things. So what do you think is depicted there? And, I, and there, kind of by a similar um, numbers uh, game, we can say, okay, 10 out of 11 people think this is an orange carrot, then this is, prompt, this is probably something we, we can go on. So really kind of, we want to bring the, 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 the database, once we have it up and running, kind of accessible to everybody and, and kind of using an app as, as David was referring to, uh, to kind of have people say, I think there is an orange carrot, there is a purple carrot, there is a parsnip, uh, there is uh, a cashew depicted on this painting, on this, uh, on this position. And I think this will really, uh, allow us to to be more accurate in, in uh, what what is there to kind of extend our knowledge of what people have been have been depicting but also to kind of encourage people to do some science uh, because it, 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 it gives you a very interesting and exciting outcome you, you can help uh, a research project forward by contributing your own personal experience and, and knowledge and interest uh, to this so I think that's the kind of direction that we're that we're heading with this and I think uh, open access is is one important part of this of course to kind of draw in um, the public David yes so the um, the point that um, he was making is uh, quite true so um, only now do we see that big collections are redoing their inventory and trying to identify more um, uh, parameters that are on the painting which helps us uh, if we want to find a cauliflower or something uh, so that's good but most uh, collections uh, still have lists 
which uh, only lists titles and maybe a small uh, description and does not that does not really leave that much room uh, for us to uh, you know go over the inventory and, and look for the things that we need so what we need is eyes on a painting we need to eyeball every uh, painting but um, in terms of accessibility uh, it was another great point that you were raising a second ago um, the UNESCO list um, does you know kind of um, protect uh, a lot of uh, cultural heritage of humanity and that sometimes that list grows a bit shorter because things get destroyed or get lost. Um, fortunately uh, for us uh, this list does exist and it does kind of help to even symbolically protect the cultural heritage uh, that is in, uh, in danger. Now in terms of um, uh, this cultural heritage that already exists. Whenever we lose a 16th century painting, whenever we lose a uh, second century uh, mural, it is lost forever. So we cannot really get it back somehow. Uh, so everything that is re being recorded and is being described is already very good work in terms of conserving the knowledge that is interested, in, uh, interesting for our kind of uh, project. So um, yes, it is um, difficult to uh, or even hard to see that, uh, for example, what happened to museums in um, Iraq or Libya or other places that were really hurt by uh, civil war or by warfare, to see a lot of cultural heritage being uh, destroyed. Now, uh, this is also a uh, setback for our kind of research because um, if you want to uh, find out the, about the depictions and uh, really descriptions of uh, crops like, uh, like wheat or cereals that kind of developed in those regions, then um, no doubt uh, we have lost um, interesting images. So um, these go to kind of the heart of our project. Um, our knowledge is only as strong as the data that we can use. And um, finding it is one thing, but preserving it and making sure that it is to be found, that it is still accessible, that's the hard bit. So we need uh, help. That's the, uh, the, the, the main message, I think, of our project is to seek out this participation of citizens who know of sometimes obscure uh, paintings or sculptures and to really try and motivate these people to alert us to the existence of them. Um, that is quite quite important. Yeah, th thank you, uh, David and Eve, for this. Uh, we could go on talking about various aspects of this, you know, I'm sure. And uh, uh, because you're also writing uh, in the next issue, I'm, I'm sure people will, uh, you know, see, see that uh, in writing. And would you also like to show a couple of pictures like which you had in the thing and uh, or at this stage or uh, we will open it for uh, con Q&A now. Well, it, it, it might be interesting to kind of go back to um, slide yeah. five, yeah. Uh, which, which kind of brings uh, an interesting uh, genetic concept uh, associated with, uh, with wheat to the, to the attention. Huh? Um, I think if you uh, nowadays uh, go into the field, um, you kind of see wheat uh, as, as kind of reaching knees or, or at maximum your, your hips. No? Uh, but if you go back to paintings from, uh, from Bruegel uh, and even, even further back to, to, paint, to works from, from the, the old Egyptians, uh, we see that wheat is the size of, of a person. Uh, and, and of course you could can kind of always use the argument, okay, uh, maybe people were smaller at the time, uh, but if you look at this, and, and people have looked at this, uh, there is no major difference there. I mean, it, it, it kind of a couple of centimeters, but not something that really can explain this, uh, this massive difference. So um, the interesting thing is that the, the kind of wheat of a smaller statue only kind of uh, emerged in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and, and this is associated with, uh, with the work of, of Norman Borlaug. Uh, so he kind of introduced uh, this kind of shorter cropping wheat uh, and he also he also got the Peace Nobel Prize for this because it kind of really 
uh, guaranteed food security for, for a lot of people uh, at the time. Uh, and, and the underlying reason is that, uh, and I think that that kind of is then the, the molecular biological link that I'm trying to bring into this, uh, is that, so we now know uh, the, the kind of genetic components that explain why you go from something that is tall to, to a smaller stature, uh, and it's kind of the loss of uh, a kind of a growth hormone, the kind of either the activity of this uh, growth hormone or the production of this uh, growth hormone, it's kind of preferred to as uh, gibberellic acid, uh, that is then being affected. Uh, and, and you really kind of use this, you can really use this as a very nice example uh, of how we can go from something that we see on a painting uh, that has changed over time and finding uh, a molecular uh, explanation for that. And I think the same holds true for uh, maybe then the next slide uh, where we can have uh, the colors that I was referring to. So we kind of now have a very good insight in uh, these various uh, colors. Uh, so how do you get something that is red? It's because of the production of lycopene, uh, carotenoids, orange, uh, lutein, uh, yellow, anthocyanins, purple. Uh, so if there is any kind of change in uh, the underlying enzymes uh, that kind of lead to the production of these, uh, of these colors, this will lead to a change in, for example, carrot color, or to a change, and then if you go to the, the next slide, to a change in, um, in the color of uh, the watermelon. And, and this is kind of interesting because we've been talking about, okay, a modern typical watermelon, dark red on the inside. We do see that the outside, kind of the typical uh, alternating dark and pale stripes uh, has remained largely unchanged. So if we look at depictions of something that is recognizably a watermelon from the old Egyptians, we do see that kind of uh, stripy pattern. So the kind of outside hasn't really changed, but we mentioned that uh, on the inside, if we cut it through, we have pinkish ones, whitish ones, pale looking ones, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and this is uh, likely due to uh, a mutation in the enzyme that is uh, causing the production of uh, carotenoid. So if you kind of interfere with that, you will accumulate more uh, lycopene. Uh, but interestingly, and this is something that we really need to explore in a little bit more detail and which we can hopefully answer if we get more images. Uh, uh, recently, uh, a lab, I think a German lab, uh, looked at the genome of the watermelon leaf that was preserved 3,000, 3,500 years ago with a pharaoh. So they, they kind of, this leaf was buried together with this pharaoh, was preserved, and uh, the genetic information could be extracted from that. Uh, and there they kind of observed that uh, the genetic composition of that watermelon was something that would be leading to something that is dark red and rather sweet. So although the old Egyptians already had this kind of typical looking watermelon, over time, for some reason, the pale looking uh, one emerged as another variety that, that was rather common uh, in, in, our, in our areas. So this is, this is something that uh, we would really like to explore in, uh, in a little bit more, uh, more detail. Thank you. Um, Rinaldi, let's uh, take questions now. Yeah, I'm just, um, just wait. Let me just turn on the video. Yes. Okay. So uh, we've already got a bunch of uh, questions. Uh, we can start with one which has been posed by uh, Bhupati Srinivasan. Uh, so Bhupati is asking, um, uh, this could be answered by David or Eve actually. Um, do we have uh, an aesthetic or art movement associated with um, such a perspective of looking for correctness of a non-human subject? Um, so basically he's talking about realism and um, he wants to know in fact if uh, you know the kind of specific images that you are looking at in fact uh, all of them seem to reflect uh, realism, naturalism, in fact, an obsession with getting details as accurate as possible. So is there a specific set of art movements that you're also looking at um, in the course of your research? Well, 
Uh, yes, there is. There are um, certain times in Western art history where this obsession with uh, painting true to life becomes very important. And it goes back to um, ancient Greeks. We, we have very little ancient Greek uh, paintings, but um, there is this um, debate uh, going back to all the way to Plato that uh, talks about art as the mirror of this world. And um, they refer to it as uh, zoixis uh, in Greek, which is the concept of trying to uh, find the veracity of nature in art. Uh, Romans were crazy about it, so they uh, tried to recreate with all kinds of optical illusions the things that they were observing into reality, which makes a uh, Roman character, if one is depicted, quite extraordinary and quite useful. Now, um, in the period following the decline of the Roman Empire, we see that um, during the period we call in European history the, the, the medieval time period in which the um, um, art becomes more in service of uh, power of religion, power of um, uh, theology, then um, this depiction of the world as we see them does not really sit too comfortable because um, this world is only a perishable world and we should focus on the world that is above. So then, yes, the spiritual world. So the obsession with painting true to life becomes kind of fades away. Now, in the Renaissance again, we um, find this uh, rediscovery of uh, ancient principles, including uh, the Euclidic perspective. And so the Euclidic perspective, which you can see on the painting by Raphael and uh, Perugino and uh, so many other painters, uh, really is a um, depiction of a world that isn't really there, but it makes you believe that it is there. So that's what we call a trompe l'oeil. It, it depicts a space, kind of a cube. Well, everybody knows that the painting is a flat. So in fact, this kind of art is, is a lie, if you wish, because it tries to project something from reality which is, which is not in fact there. So starting from that humanistic period, uh, 15th, 16th century, we do find this obsession to paint through to life. And the most important um, artists uh, following that uh, period of humanism, uh, starting with the generation of Jan van Eyck, who was a um, uh, Flemish painter, um, really has this obsession with painting true to life. Uh, this obsession which uh, translates in, in extraordinary pictures, in extraordinary realism, uh, which then starts off uh, in a tradition of its own, all the way to uh, the golden age of Dutch painting, for example. Um, that's the age of Rembrandt and Vermeer. And uh, they again, in turn, have this uh, influence on French and German painters uh, after them. So this tradition of uh, painting true to life is um, always pretty lurking in Western uh, art. And it is quite important to um, know which artists adhered to this theory and which artists dismissed this theory because that would be uh, a um, very valuable source for our investigation. Now, as it comes to um, non-European art, uh, there is in fact uh, the problem because uh, I am a scholar who is uh, mainly interested and mainly versed in Western style art. So that means we need help. Uh, we need help to find uh, the specialists who are um, uh, very versed in, um, for example, uh, Indian art or Indonesian, Japanese, Chinese art, uh, who can, I don't know, function as a kind of guide or a Sherpa to, uh, um, to weed out the information that we actually need. So in short, and to answer the question, yes, there were very specific artists and very specific movements. For example, in Dutch art, the, um, the, the, uh, really highlight of trying to paint true to life were uh, painters around Leiden who were obsessed with uh, painting uh, true to life. So yes, there were specific times and places and artists and movements who were interested in depicting uh, everything true to life. I guess it's also clear that, that we don't want to have works from Picasso or uh, people like that and who kind of really have a different yeah. view on how to depict things. Uh, so I think this 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 realism is is kind of important there. 
Yes. Uh, so, in fact, something that uh, David's already, uh, like, you know, uh, referred to, but it's also come up in another question. Uh, this is from Mariam Begum. So she said, I am curious to know about similar investigations um, in miniature art across Middle East and Central Asia. And something that actually came to my mind when I was listening to the two of you is because, uh, especially if you look at a lot of Mughal miniature painting, as well as uh, painting from the Deccan, in fact, there's an entire period when there's an obsession with images from the natural world, giant birds, fruits taking over, etc. Almost a kind of heightened sense of realism that's there, in fact. So have you been able to expand this project to actually even consider looking at other cultures or other art forms, in fact, that have engaged with, uh, you know, uh, uh, realism as well as in fact some of the uh, kind of plant biology systems that you are looking at. I guess that's a bit the idea of our pitch here no? to try and really do that. Um, okay. So I think, I think we refer to, to the mochi where we kind of touched upon this uh, a little bit. Uh, we have of course the, the kind of the ancient uh, Egyptian art uh, that, that we can that we can introduce in our in our work. Um, but we really lack, uh, I think, as, as David also mentioned, the, the insight, the expertise, um, and the actual works from, from these other regions uh, in order to draw conclusions from that. So I think we, we, have, we have written now a couple of, of short stories, uh, like, for example, one on the carrot. Uh, and I think we, we very often end uh, in, our, in our conclusion and future perspectives with the sentence, we need more information from, for example, Asia. Uh, and, and it would be really helpful if, if we have people with relevant expertise, uh, relevant know-how, um, kind of providing us that kind of knowledge. Uh, Actually, uh, Mark did a book on, um, uh, like, you know, Mughal uh, paintings, which is coming to mind, in fact, so we should be able to share that link with you at some point of time. And we've also done something on botanical art, which was coming to mind. So mm. one of the questions I had was because, again, the kind of um, artworks that uh, you are looking at, it's of a certain kind, but there's also a rich traditional of uh, botanical art, which is somewhere existing in close association with the sciences, and which is largely there, in fact, for documentation. But of course, currently, we go back to a lot of that and then think of it in terms of art instead of just like, you know, scientific documentation. So have you looked at that particular area as well when you do your studies? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that's also very, very interesting. I think in, in Europe, we have a couple of works from, from the Duns, for example, uh, who had some kind of beautiful... Um, books on, on, on botany at the time with, with uh, detailed, uh, what is it, woodwork, uh, I don't know, do you call them paintings? Uh, 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 woodcuts. Woodcuts. Uh, so, so these kind of things are obviously also interesting. So I, I think we kind of um, maybe refer to it a little bit too one-sided as uh, art uh, in, in such a way. Uh, but all this other information is also extremely valuable. And I think we, we would even you know, be interested in extending this to, uh, to literature as well, because you have, for example, uh, cookbooks and things like that, uh, which also include, obviously, descriptions of ingredients. They don't always accurately describe uh, color and things like that, but at least it tells you that a certain ingredient was around at a certain time. If, if a cook uh, in uh, Northern Africa talks, uh, talks about a carrot, yeah, then the carrot must have reached that, that region and, and must be used. Same holds true for melons and, and, and these kind of things. So, so that's also a very important and, and valuable uh, information. Uh, so it's not purely the stuff that you can typically find in, in museum, but also these, these botanical uh, descriptions. And I think there's some other works that maybe David can can flag. Okay. Um, the next question is by Prachi Belankar, and uh, this is to Eve. Um, how can the study of plants in paintings inform us about the larger landscape system of a particular geographic region? Okay. So yeah, that's also an interesting one. I think I think I think with with all this artwork, you can do a lot of things. I mean, you can look at you can look at the domestication of uh, of animals. You can, you can look at the introduction of 
uh, species from, from exotic regions when they appeared and that kind of again goes together with discoveries, colonization, uh, trade routes and these, and these kind of things. And of course you can also look at, at landscapes and how these landscapes uh, changed over time. I think uh, very often you have very recognizable features and I think David also mentioned this uh, that if you have a certain building being, de being depicted, a certain city being uh, depicted in, in the background, and this is still recognizable as it looks today, uh, you can assume that then the surrounding landscape would also be accurately depicted, and then you can see uh, if changes uh, have, have occurred. Um, in addition to that, I think some of these painters uh, are adding so much detailed information, uh, for example, on particular uh, butterflies, moths, uh, growth of, of lichens uh, on, on trees and so on, 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 um, on rocks, uh, that with that kind of information you can also deduce something about potential pollution that, uh, that was occurring in a certain region uh, or how kind of clean the air was depending on uh, what, what they depict. So I think you can really kind of open this up to uh, uh, a lot of other uh, disciplines uh, but I think at, at this stage it's important uh, to stress that this is a non-funded hobby project for the two of us. So if people would be willing to throw a lot of money at us, uh, <laughs> we can of course we can of course extend this to a wider scope. Uh, but for now we kind of try to kind of keep it focused on plant-based uh, food. Um, David, would you uh, like to say something also on this? Because I'm curious. There's right? another question which David can also answer. But yes, first he can address whatever we've already been discussing. I was in total agreement with Eve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a rare, uh, rare event. But. <laughs> Okay, uh, so Kesang Bhutia, in fact, thanks the two of you for a wonderful talk. And then um, the question is, I would like to know if you're also focusing on ornamental plants. Historical art can also be used to trace the pathways or history of the introduction of invasive species, uh, where there's a lack of well-documented records of introduction. Well, I think uh, that's also something that Eve uh, has already covered, I guess. Um, Yes, we do. Uh, every sort of that gets introduced um, might come into conflict with the existing ecosystem, has uh, some trouble to adapt, uh, will eventually uh, change either the system um, it is in or will adapt itself. And so we have these kind of um, uh, examples of, uh, for example, the way um, we treat the potato as a food and uh, a, um, uh, the, the dangers that uh, went along with them. Uh, but indeed, um, I guess the, uh, some of the uh, artwork that we are referring to is not only to be found in paintings or uh, in museums, it is, can also be found in furniture, for example, and it can also be found in um, uh, many other little trivial aspects of everyday life, for example, uh, decorative china and so on. So um, some uh, uh, plants or uh, some uh, new fruits um, come into uh, Europe and are automatically um, sort of um, made part of a decorative uh, vocabulary. And uh, one of the examples there is the existence of um, uh, southern or actually German Rococo style, which made use of uh, exotic plants uh, in terms of uh, decoration. So uh, yes, the decorative arts uh, certainly are very uh, interesting there. Um, also in terms of uh, medieval manuscripts, uh, where you do often find these strawberry decorations, uh, which does not depict uh, that often the, the strawberry itself, but the plant. So um, it also gives an indication on how um, aware people were of their surroundings and how decorative they uh, or decoratively they could use this um, these forms that they found in nature. But uh, I agree with what Eve uh, said uh, previously. So uh, um, I think it comes down to this entire idea of migration of uh, species and crops, which is uh, kind of the things we are working on and we are trying to work out when, what happened, where. And um, especially the uh, uh, 
art production gives us a very special insight into uh, answering all these questions. Um, so I'm not sure respect, if I, sorry, I think uh, with respect to maybe ornamental plants and, and garden plants, um, that, that and maybe a nice example are the roses. No? I mean, we see these roses being uh, exuberantly depicted on various paintings, uh, and there is this kind of very nice collection of uh, roses that is kind of available from breeders, for example, uh, that kind of go from modern roses, but really kind of go back centuries uh, to kind of really say, can we now link what we still know, because we can still grow these, uh, grow these roses, uh, and how uh, similar are they to what uh, has been depicted. And I think this is, can also then be used as, for example, as, uh, as a reference to assess uh, the quality of some of these, uh, of these artworks. Uh, but again, I think some of these things will, at the moment, will, would lead us too far. So we kind of really try to, to stick to, to particular fruits and, and vegetables and, and certain cereal crops. Uh, all right, I think we can end the session with just one or two more questions. Uh, so that's Shoya Bali, and he's asking, um, what do the aesthetics of archival knowledge imply for agricultural science and its extension? So I think he's concerned about also agricultural science at present. So when you think of historical knowledge, mm. in fact, what um, no. uh, implications does it have for science today? Or, you know, how is it useful? I think that, that that's a really exciting part, no? because um, you can go to your, your modern day supermarket and, and you can basically get everything that you want and that you need uh, with, with all this kind of diversity and, and uh, in taste and color and shape and so on and so forth. Um, but we are also starting to realize that there are a number of um, problems associated with uh, how we have kind of domesticated, cultivated, improved uh, our modern day crops. Uh, so there are some certain allergies associated with, uh, with certain cereals, with, with wheat, and, uh, for example. So then it might make sense uh, to go back to these old varieties uh, where, where they kind of really have this kind of ancestral genomes uh, which have not been improved for certain traits that, that have been useful over the years. Uh, but but the really kind of the uh, yeah, the ancestral information that is there that can be exploited. And I think the same holds true for, for, like, for example, like, like potatoes. Uh, I mean, there are a number of um, biotic stresses, for example, Phytophthora, that are associated with, with potato growing uh, that we still haven't really uh, fully addressed. I mean, we, we, we now largely tackle this through pesticides. Uh, but there are a number of uh, old varieties that are naturally more tolerant to these infections, so we could exploit that uh, historical information, that kind of really that uh, genetic pool uh, from these ancestors to try and improve uh, our modern uh, modern day crops as well. So it, it really also has agricultural implications. Also in the context of the example that I was giving with uh, with wheat, no, I mean uh, people have been growing this rather tall wheat uh, for centuries, uh, but at some point when you reach a certain stage where you cannot provide food security uh, with that anymore, you need to introduce certain improvements. And these improvements have, have been uh, on the genetic level, uh, but also on the agricultural level. So you kind of harvesting practices have changed, um, fertilization practices have changed. So if you combine all these components together, you, you kind of obtain something that is highly productive in a certain uh, era. But now we've kind of reached the stage where we might have over fertilized. So where we might uh, need to change our fertilization uh, practices. Uh, and instead of then having these short stature wheat, which can be really productive in that particular context, we might find, uh, we might need something that is now somewhere in the middle in between these rather tall ones, uh, which were rather efficient in taking up and storing uh, all these nutrients and then remobilizing them at the stage of, uh, of seed development, we might need something to kind of go back to that a little bit more. So I think we can also learn from um, ancient agricultural practices, which doesn't mean that, that we need to go back to, to some of these, uh, these uh, agricultural practices, but at least we can take some of these co concepts together with our modern day technology uh, on uh, genetic improvements. Uh, and I think we, uh, we haven't touched upon this, but I think modern, modern technology uh, like CRISPR, which kind of really allows us now uh, to, to tailor 
certain crops in a certain way, uh, in a kind of very rapid way. So we can, uh, we can bypass uh, the kind of breeding processes that would normally take decades. And we can really try to, with all the, the knowledge that we have at the moment, to uh, introduce useful genetic information from uh, these historical crops into our modern day crops in a few years and in a really kind of focused and targeted way. Okay, I think uh, you, like there are a, a bunch of other questions coming to my mind, but we've really run out of time. So I think I could pose that to David and Eve separately. But um, I think Rizio, if you want any closing remarks uh, also from David and Eve uh, and then, Eve, uh, would you like to say something before we close? Well, I, I hope that people found it a little bit entertaining, and I think we can we can probably talk for hours about what we've done uh, in the past and all the stories that we've unearthed. Um, but we would very much appreciate if uh, people would send us information. And I think if you, uh, I think in, in the um, article that that will be published, uh, the email address to uh, contact us is included uh, and maybe this can also be posted associated with with this uh, recording uh, if people just send us uh, whatever information they have this can be observations that can be paintings it can be interpretations uh, of certain things that that would be extremely helpful and, and very much uh, appreciated david your uh Again, I'm in total agreement with you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's amazing. This is like probably a world record. Like that. twice, <laughs> and, uh, totally agrees with me, which, which kind of rarely happens. Not only about art, but like basically everything. It, it's just because there are so many people around. I do not want to get into the okay. specifics. But, uh, right. No, but it, the, the, the fundamental point still uh, is there. We are just two friends who came up with a project and uh, this is kind of a hobby project that got way out of hand and we have now a lot of data and we have published a lot of things and we have we are still busy but it's just the two of us and we really need help and um, especially when you were talking about the um, uh, Indian perspective well uh, if there, there is uh, scientific literature about art history which can set us on the path of uh, unearthing more interesting images from that particular subcontinent that, that would be much appreciated um, it will be studied. Thank you very much, uh, Eve and David. Uh, as Nalan said, we've really run out of time, but... Uh, yeah, there's all, there are a bunch of other questions which uh, <laughs> just came in, so I think we'll have to send a separate mail to them, in yeah, fact, with these yeah, questions. Yeah, so, yeah. That, will yeah. Be, that can be done. Um, uh, but uh, this has been a really insightful uh, conversation, uh, obviously, but uh, mo most importantly for Marg at this point, when we are opening this space uh, for interdisciplinarity uh, with this uh, new uh, format of the magazine. Um, I think uh, this is very critical. Your essay in the next issue is also very critical for us. And I would uh, uh, once again request the audience to be part of the October 7th launch event and also subscribe to Mark because uh, these kind of interesting things which we really want to continue uh, exploring, um, not just you know, look at this as random contributions, but we would like to be in continuous engagement with, uh, um, with all the scholars, writers who are writing for us, uh, who are contributing to Mark. So it, we, we don't think of this as some kind of a uh, publishing project that we do and then we finish with that, but this is a larger uh, public intellectual project, Mark itself, as uh, its name indicates, it's a road. So on the road, they would invite uh, uh, whoever can join this road. Um, if we will be very happy if projects like this, you know, they take off from Mark's pages and Mark's platforms and uh, take their own life and shapes and everything. So they will be happy to witness that. So to be instrumental in being that that space, uh, and uh, you know, to be that space is our intention. To be that road where people come and meet and converge, exchange ideas, and you know, go their own their own paths. That'll be a happy thing to see. So be part of this journey that we are now uh, starting. And uh, I hope to see all of you on October seven in Renal. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you everyone for making this a really stimulating session and I think we'll uh, bring it to a close for today. Uh, but of course, if you've missed out on any part of this uh, session, please look at our YouTube page or our Facebook page because we'll be putting up a full recording of that and do share it with uh, all your uh, friends and other people who might be interested. And uh, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook as well as visit the website. As Rizio said, in fact, we're going to be uh, launching the new magazine, but you'll also have access to all our archives as well as our other books as well as magazines and uh, and see you on October 7th. The next Mark Salon is going to be on October 16th uh, where we'll be looking at digital technologies and art archives and we'll have with us Beth Citron and Deeksha Nath. So see you there as well and uh, yes look forward to more of your support as well as these continuing interactions. So Good night for now, or goodbye for now. Good day, actually, to Eve <laughs> yeah. and David, because they are still in the middle of the day. Yeah. Thank you very much, all of you, and thank you, David and Eve, once again. See you You're soon. Welcome. Be prepared for a bunch of questions coming your way. Okay, all right. no problem. <laughs> we'll be looking okay. forward to it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.